Hello and welcome to the first fireside chat of this year's CPH Lab. Now, for those who don't know, uh, the CPH Lab is CPH Docs' program for bringing together artists and creative technologists to develop new forms of expression in documentary. Uh, this year we have six projects, all responding to the theme Protopia. Now, this is a term that was coined by the futurist Kevin Kelly to describe a world that's just a little bit better than, than the one in which we live. Uh, whereas a utopia is something that's distant and unachievable, we should be able to take small steps in order to achieve a protopia. But what will that look like? Well, we hope to exhibit these six works um, as a collection at CPH Docs so that you can see what these visions will be um, uh, in March, but both physically and virtually. But for now, we're still working on, first of all, developing and then creating these projects. Um, and during the course of the workshops, the work of Marshmallow Laser Feast is often cited as an inspiration or a reference point. And particularly so since a number of this year's projects examine what connects us to the natural world. Um, and this is exactly the kind of space that um, Marshmallow Laser Feast has been exploring over a number of different projects. So we're really delighted to have Barney here, who's going to represent the collective of Marshmallow Laser Feast, um, who will be talking about existence tissue. He'll be talking for about 40 minutes. Um, so feel free to put some questions in the chat and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So Barney, hello. Ahoy, thanks hey, for having me. Know. So testing, testing. So you can hear me fine. Everything's up and running. Very good. I shall. Um, well, actually, I'm in my I'm in my studio here. It's deserted. Got the fancy dress cupboard here. Lots of um, touring. Lots of touring equipment, but, but um, nothing's on tour at the moment, which is um, a little bit worrying. And then we've got the kind of. Uh, the tracking zone where we do a lot of our motion capture and explore the wonderful world of um, avatars and virtual reality. Um, but I've prepared a, a presentation and it's, it's great. I've, we've had lots of fun with Mark in the past and um, yeah, it's great to just be asked to speak and you know share, I guess, some of the insights or some of the, the concepts that are, that are driving our work. Um, like Mark said, Marshmallow Laser Feast is a collective and um, actually since, since the beginning it's been really about collaboration and bringing together scientists and artists and musicians always need really good producers um, to, to, to glue it all together and um, yeah it's really grown like that so there's a lot of freelancers and, um, and there's a, a core team of very passionate people um, so I'll give you a little, I've got this presentation here, so let me go to screen share mode. Share screen, thank you. There we go. Put that one there. Okay, so, so can everybody see my screen? Or someone say, dude, it's not working if, if you, because it'd be horrible to be talking to myself. We, we good? Okay, I presume you can see it. Um, so, um, a little bit about Marshmallow Laser Feast. So, we, when we started the company, the whole idea was um, to do commercial work, to fund our artistic practice. And as far as art goes, it's really all about passion projects. Um, so, here's the kind of um, showreel, full range of um, really wild, technically difficult projects. We, we're quite obsessed with technology and how, how we can use that to. Um, and um, perception and explore other formats of immersion. Um, but actually in the past, uh, maybe the focus was more on the technology than the ideas. Um, it came out in play and exploration more than making foresight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in our time from more commercial work to more artistic work. So anyway, we were sort of doing a lot of this stuff and we started to feel a bit like this guy. And immersed, oh, it's really weird when you can't tell if anyone's smiling. Made me smile. Um, it's like talking to myself, it's so weird. Uh, 
you start to feel a bit like this guy. So we're like, oh yeah, technology, drones, let, you know, let's, let's play with all of this stuff. And it is genuinely super fun to play with, but um, you know, there was other deeper things going on in the world. And um, this doesn't work so well when you're talking to yourself, but obviously everyone can, can name these logos, but who can name these leaves? I mean, I'm sure we can all name that leaf, but actually, I can't even name all these leaves either. And it was um, my colleague Urson that put this little slide together. And it's just a reminder of how, um, you know, we're, we're living in these urban bubbles and we're, we're really quite disconnected from nature. And so these ideas, um, as we were exploring drone shows and technology and LIDAR scanning, there was really a transition point that I think probably a lot of creatives are going through, which is a recognition of how detached we've become from nature and that when you're born into this sort of man-made bubble, it's maybe not immediately apparent. Um, obviously, we're living in, in strange times. We've entered the Anthropocene, and, you know, taking that perspective, um, that satellite perspective of the Earth in, you know, in one generation, um, we've completely transformed the face of the planet. So it just started, um, you know, these kind of... You know, the crisis of our times, it has to be something um, that's going to affect the, the work we're doing, you know, the question of why are we doing it and, um, and what's the, the greater purpose started to come up more and more often. Um, I think just, I mean, we, you, you're all probably quite familiar with the, um, the overpopulation issue, but something that came up in our conversations was um, it just increased urbanization. More and more people are moving to cities, more and more people are born in cities. Um, and so it really, this, uh, this concept of creating experiences or creating work that talks about a relationship with nature and bringing them to the city um, is something that came up again and again. Um, otherwise you can end up sort of preaching to the converted and it doesn't really have any kind of impact. Um, Satis Kumar is a big influence. Um, he puts forward in this wonderful book that my mum got me, Soil Soul Society, a new trinity for our time. But one, one of the really powerful passages was talking about um, in order to, for behaviour change to really stick, to move from consumerism to conservation mindsets, um, you really need to have a deep experience in nature where you fall in love. And so, you know, it can kind of sound a little bit fluffy, but um, like when he's explaining it, he talks about you know, going off into a forest on your own for, for a week and um, the sensitivity that comes up and in silence and observation of nature, it can really have a transformative um, impact on people's souls because because of this deep underlying connection that maybe we don't we don't get that sensitivity in, in an urban environment um and so it stuck this is this is one thing so deep experience in nature and a falling in love and another guy uh, richard Feynman. oh let's see if you can play him so he's not playing but i know what he says so i can do my richard Feynman accent um, uh, so he's talking about um, actually he's American. I'll, I'll just use my voice then. Um, so he's, uh, he is talking about his artist friend. His artist friend is, um, he's got an incredible sensitivity to a flower and he, he can draw this flower better than Richard can. And, and maybe as an artist, he's got a, a sort of an aesthetic sense that's more evolved than, than Richard's aesthetic sense. But then Richard starts to talk about, um, how a scientist looks at a flower and the, the, when he sees more than just the aesthetics and the, and the texture, he sees the, the reason that that flower is red is because it's uh, co-evolved with the eyeball of a pollinator and it asks interesting questions like why has that pollinator got an aesthetic sense like we have? Um, and there's, there's deeper, deeper questions, you know, when you start thinking about the inner workings of the flower and photosynthesis, um, you know, the fact that it can eat sunlight and, uh, and exhale oxygen um, is, you know, one of the key drivers for life on the planet. Without that, there's, there's no atmosphere, there's, there's no life, except in those like deep sea vent things, which are kind of, there's not much going on there. Um, so these, these kind of ideas are, are really at the core of, of what we're exploring. And, and just to sort of thread them together, so as, as you know, we, we do a lot of exploration with technology and 
I think um, thinking about technology in relationship to perception is this long narrative of, um, of how um, technology can change the way we, we see the world. So as an example, um, everyone was, was painting horses like this until um, the uh, Mybridge um, did this wonderful image sequence of a horse running. And now probably if you were to ask most people to draw a picture of the horse, they would have this image in their mind which is uh, strengthened by watching horses running in slow motion and film and everything else, all, all these different formats that paint a picture of how a horse moves that's beyond the limits of our perception. And so my point here is that um, the, the stories or the, the images, the, um, the, yeah, I guess the, the images that we get um, fed through science actually become um, stamped on our in, in our awareness and so when when we when we're sort of drawing our picture of reality we're drawing upon that database those stories those images another good example is when you look up at the night sky we're now so familiar with these hubble images but in um you know back in the day that black and white image would have been the cutting edge of technology so you know when you do look up at the night sky you don't see either of these images but you can be sure that in the background of your mind, there's um, an impact or where the imagination takes over, these images are there and they affect um, the way that you see the world. So, um, so these, these kind of pillars, just to sort of sum it up, it was thinking about deep experiences of nature, how science can expand our perception and offer um, a lens on the world that's beyond the limits of our perception. And, and then how do these things sort of create a stamp on you as a human and affect the way that you relate to the world? You know, can you have transformative experiences that change the way you think about yourself in relationship to nature? So um, I'm just gonna go through a few projects um, that sort of talk to that point. In the Eyes of the Animal was one of our, our sort of first um, main forays into um, virtual reality and found this quote actually um, which beautifully sums it up looking at the world from another species point of view is the cure for the disease of human self-importance i love that one um but this this project i'll, uh, I'll talk over the video here and, um, this project was basically looking at a um a sort of a volume a 20 meter volume in a forest that we lidar scanned and then thinking about how that one space is occupied by all, of, by all of these different organisms. And depending on what organism you embody, time changes. You, th you think of a dragonfly that um, in relationship to our 25 frames a second perception, a dragonfly is operating at 300 frames a second if we're talking sort of film, film speeds. So, um, you know, its version of reality, it's the length of its life is, is completely different when it comes to time. Also, a dragonfly is seeing in a completely different color spectrum. It's sensitive to ultraviolet and infrared. Um, in fact, this, this one here was an exploration of an owl. Well, oh, this is my dad. What a show. <laughs> what a show. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Very clever. Amazing. You know that, Dad? Oh, what? That was <laughs> really so good. And the sound, the sound with it as well. And the thumping on your pack. Like, that was right. man. Yeah. Until that time, it was like, hey, Dad, check out what I've done. And it would be um, a sort of an animation for McLaren or something. And then and it's like, oh, Dad, I've got this project in a forest. And um, I don't know if, if Dad's into taking mushrooms. I don't think he, he hasn't told me about taking mushrooms. So for someone that's never had an, an experience like that, then to, to dive into a, a virtual reality experience is a pretty bonkers, um, bonkers thing to do. So um, very rewarding. And I always get my parents in. It's, they're going to appear again later uh, in the presentation. So this was, um, yeah, for, so a, bit, a bit of the technical side. We had lots of um, computers in... Um, waterproof dog houses with the generator way over a hill so you couldn't hear it and uh, we hid the sort of camouflage waterproof dog houses um, in the shrubs around the back so from an audience perspective they saw these helmets suspended from trees and um, and that was half of the the idea that how can you create a virtual reality experience that changes your perception of 
the forest that you're in. And what we found is when people took the headsets off, they they hung around to like look at look down in the puddle where the frog was and actually in the end we had to move the installation so it wasn't the same place but it didn't matter people didn't quite realize so the intention still worked but it's most powerful when it's in a forest because um, it's really all about um, what happens when you take the headset off and can it change the way you think about um, about these things and I guess also we're so used to our, our human sensory sacs it's pretty wild to even though it's not really you know you're not embodying a a frog or a mosquito, but you're get, getting a, a sort of poetic sense of what the world might look like through their um, through their eyes. But it's also kind of important to say that you can't simulate in the same way a blind person. Um, if you're trying to explain to a, a blind person what what colour looks like, there's no words that could articulate the richness of the, the sense of colour. Um, I think the same applies equally to, you know, trying to create an impression of a sense that you don't have. And obviously when you're dealing with other organisms, then there's a collage of different um, senses that are, are way beyond or completely alien to anything we could experience. And that, that's where we can sort of artistically interpret um, the science. So this led to the idea of time. Time is the big barrier between the, the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom. And I'm a big fan of this quote, duration of the beat of a hummingbird's wing is as concealed to our sensory organs as is the drifting of the continents. So it's interesting to think about virtual reality and, um, and sort of compressing and stretching time to bring um, phenomenon into our, you know, phenomenon such as you know, a, a tree breathing, for example. Trees can be, look at this tree. I mean, we spent ages in um, California. It was such a, it was one of my be the best years of my life, just living in LA, doing multiple scanning trips and uh, working with scientists to understand um, some of the science, some of the mysteries of these trees, actually. They're, they're not even sure how the, uh, the water can get up so high. Um, uh, it sort of defies our scientific understanding. And it's obviously it's still a lot of mysteries uh, when it comes to nature. But uh, this is a sequoia tree, in Sequoia National Park. And so it's one of the biggest organisms on the planet. But in a way, it feels more like a building. You, know, you, you, you can't see it moving. You can't see it breathing. You can't see its roots under the soil. But, um, you know, it's, it's a living, breathing being. Some of the oldest ones can live up to 3,000 years. So um, we started to um, explore LIDAR scanning, pushing it to another level. This has is, this is actually never been seen in any of our exhibitions because the graphics cards just haven't been good enough. Um, but the, this is the raw data from the LIDAR scans that we're doing. So we really push the limits. We're thinking about our projects as kind of like a digital archive. Um, and it's, it's very much our intention to share the data um, I mean, I don't know if you've seen our website, it's a joke, but um, it's on our to-do list. And um, yeah, the, the plan is to, to open source all of the data so that um, scientists and other artists can use it. And, and, and eventually, you know, as sort of graphics cards catch up with the, um, the scanning technologies, then it opens up really interesting possibilities in terms of... Um, of immersion and sense of presence in a place that, um, like I said before, transporting the wonders of nature from distant ecosystems that most people will never get to visit and bringing them into urban environments. So, you know, this younger generation and the, the masses can have an experience of, um, yeah, the, the wonder of the planet in this global civilization where, you know, you reach for something on a supermarket shelf and without realizing you're destroying um, ancient wonderful ecosystems so anything to sort of bridge that gap and make us more aware is um, is important um, here's some of the underlying systems of how um, water actually this is uh, glucose the glucose flowing um, down from photosynthesis down through the root structures um, so this this treat we never we've never really done all of our projects feel like trailers to the, the big feature films that we want to make and so, um, yeah, that project tree hugger, this one was really leading towards ocean of air, um, which is leading towards other projects, but 
the idea here was that we could use a breath sensor so that you could experience your um, out breath feeding the forest and in turn the out breath of the plants or at least the oxygen released through photosynthesis um, in turn flows into your body and reveals your inner inner structures your bran inner branching being um, so we, we touched upon that in this project and um, another great quote I mean a lot of these um, got so many quotes but David Abraham is one of the um, key influences behind a lot of our work and um, you know he sort of talks about animist nature but um, breathing involves a continual oscillation between exhaling and inhaling offering ourselves to the world at one moment and drawing the world into ourselves at the next and so when you think about um, got this nice animation um, in the back when you think about um, breathing, if, if you stop breathing, you, you die. So it's something that we can all relate to, that breath is life. Um, that breath is a connection between us and the trees. Who are you without a tree? There's no atmosphere without trees, there's no life. But then what is a tree without the soil? And what is a tree without the sun? We start to paint a, a picture of the world that's deeply interconnected and um, I'll get onto this idea of existence tissue a little bit later, but um, you know, very much the, the scientific view of things is that there, there really are no individuals in isolation. There's just nested ecosystems and some enmeshed relationships. And um, I feel quite strongly that the scientific narrative can reveal these truths, and it's fascinating to experience that truth because as a as a human sort of locked in our amazing bodies and locked in our perception, I think the nature of um, the way we sense the world gives us this first person perspective and it can create illusion, an illusion of separation. You know, our skin appears like a boundary, um, but when in reality, the more you start to understand about um, the way things work, you're more like a whirlpool um, of sort of a, a porous membrane than you are anything separate. Um, so just lead in, I went a bit waffly there. I think I went on a bit. I'm gonna try and cut the waffle down. Um, so this project was, um, this is the Ocean of Air project that was supposed to be waffling over the top. But um, I know that um, a lot of you guys are, are really interested in, in how these things work. So maybe in the Q and A afterwards, I can give you a little bit more insight into some of the challenges um, and uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the technology or the kind of uh, the business model behind this, this experience but for us we put all our cards on the table it was a big gamble we had to get loans and um, it's quite a scary commitment but it also felt like um, everything we've been doing had been leading up to this opportunity so um yeah, we, we put everything into it and it ran at the Saatchi Gallery for five months in the end. It was extended twice. It was supposed to be just three months. And um, yeah, and it sold out as well. So it, it really was a success and it's sitting in a box at the moment. But I think when things get back up and running, um, the technology might have moved on. We'll see. But there is there is a business model here that works. And so... Um, that's uh, an exciting um, sort of indicator of our trajectory. So um, one thing that's worth mentioning is when you're thinking about immersive experiences, you've got to think about the collage of all the senses. Um, in a way, you're, you're molding perceptions. So um, it's, it's really thinking about um, or exploring, because it's a funny one. When, you, when you're thinking about designing these projects, um, you know, there's um, a haptic narrative. So um, Often we use um, sub packs and and there's a, a soundscape which we're all really familiar with. There's um, a scent scape. Um, we've been using a range of different technologies, but scent has such a massive impact. And one thing that's worth passing on when we were uh, we were trying out all these different uh, sort of perfumes, and one of them was um, supposed to be a pine forest, but it just made you think of like toilet cleaner just because toilet cleaner have been using that piney smell. Uh, but when you're in VR sniffing the toilet cleaner smell, and you, but you're seeing a tree, you go, oh, it's a tree, in it? You think you're like, yes, yeah, a tree. So 
what your eyeballs are telling you in relationship to what your nose is telling you. Um, basically, if you, if you sniff pine needles in a toilet, your brain's going to go toilet cleaner because um, it knows you're in a toilet. So there's these interesting things that come up and, and they're not just how, how, um, how the collage of, of the senses can sort of create that emotional impact and um, a lot of this stuff, in fact, this, this diagram was something that we kind of mocked up after doing the project, sort of analyzing our workflow, but the reality of it is there's lots of trial and error and you sense it, you experience it, you go in and um, there's an intuition because you're, you're trying to create a sort of a sense of a place that you've been to. And um, so it's not as black and white as it looks here. Oh, yeah, I've got, the, I've got the numbers in. So five month run, um, we sold out. To, the, the thing with the tickets is we weren't selling out all the time, but when people didn't turn up, you could sell us a ticket that had already been sold. And so that um, bumped things up a little bit. Um, so in the end, we netted 390, but it was, you know, it was in the region of 600,000 to create the work. So um, it needs to tour for longer in order for us to move into profit. But it's a good sign that um, it made profit. That was a really um, big deal. I'll go into more detail. It does involve all your senses. And I, I, felt, I felt nourished. It's as if you're being nourished by, by the tree. Yeah. And you see the interaction between yourself and the tree. It's can't wait to speak. He's excited. Look at him. Yeah, we're, we're, it's, we are completely yeah. at one with it. You are yes. at one with it. You're not the boss. You're part oh, of it. Absolutely. <laughs> Nailed it. Yeah. You're not the boss. You're, you're one with it. Um, and that's, yeah, it's, it's, we, we had, um, Oh, and I was going to waffle. I'm going to keep going because I'm conscious of time and then we can cover some more stuff. So this is leading to a, a new project, The Tides Within Us. Um, and this came about through, um, um, yeah, through creating avatars for Ocean of Air. So we were thinking about airflow through the body. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, in doing so, this sort of rediscovery, I mean, it's mind boggling, the stuff that you learn um, which I'll go into in a moment, but it, it was just really a, a kind of a transition moment where something as everyday as our bodies suddenly became completely alien and full of wonder and mystery. Um, I mean, on one, on one perspective, you can think of everything that you could ever experience as a human, like every possible sensation. Um, you're, it's, it's just a tiny little pizza slice of, uh, of reality. And even within your own body, you're nesting all sorts of ecosystems, you know, there's all of the bacteria that have got their own sense of their own sensory reality and that, you know, they're busy about their business. You know, you've got no sense of that, but it, there, there is, it's part of you and, uh, you know, you're a walking ecosystem and you can apply that same logic to, um, you know, the, the larger environment, you know, your role within the bigger picture, um, this sort of interconnected super organism that's, that's everything on our planet. And this ties neatly into this um, beautiful book, Existence, a Story. And um, so David Hinton is looking at, he coined this idea, existence tissue. And um, he looks at this one Chinese scroll painting and um, you know, there's a sort of deep philosophy behind the practice of um, um, creating these paintings. And in a way, you can see that the canvas, the blank canvas is nothing. And from nothing comes something. And that something is rendered in, in sort of watercolor ink. And it's all rendered using the same medium. So there's no distinction between the human, the clouds, the mountains, the trees on the rocks. It's all emerging from nothing into something. And, um, and that's where this sort of idea of existence tissue comes from, in a way, um, we are all part of this same tissue of ex existence and, you know, we sniff re reality through our senses and um, we're connected to a tree that's sniffing reality through its senses. And so there's, there's never a point where you can really chop things out and separate them. There is just an, an underlying interconnectedness of all things. And so that's, um, it's just beautiful when you, when you realize that this sort of human intuition and wisdom is something that's echoed through science. So, 
you know, both, both are probing the nature of nature. And uh, so some of these images here, um, as we sort of probe inside our bodies, we, we uh, were working with um, an amazing artist, Eric Ferguson, who's a Houdini wizard. And, um, and so we started to imagine what does the flow of oxygen look like as it passes through the body. Um, this one is um, of the head. So the underlying geometry is, um, is the actual vascular structure. Um, and so these were a series of prints we were doing. Um, there's a, a nice quote here. It's a bit, a bit waffly, but, but it kind of sums up what I've been jibber jabbering on about. Humans have seen themselves as separate from nature. We've considered ourselves as superior to nature. Once we start to say that we're superior from nature, then we start to dominate nature. We start to control nature. We start to exploit nature. And that's what we've been doing for the past few hundred years. We need to realize nature is not only out there like mountains, rivers, oceans, animals, forests, etc. Humans are also nature. We're not separate, we're one. I mean, these lots of people are saying this. It's just we're not really living it. <laughs> If I could take you up in paradise. So that was Eric Ferguson. Um, I just wanted to introduce him because he's, um, he's a very talented animator. And my, my girlfriend was like, oh, check out this dude that animates penises on Instagram. This is a few years ago. And, uh, and I was like, dude, your penises are amazing. Um, we've got a project about the human body. And there's no penises in it yet, but there might be one day and uh and and so he started on this collaboration with us so all of these images i've been showing you they're, they're a collaboration with eric and um and now we're basically taking uh some of these explorations to the to a new level so we had this vision um i've got about five minutes left just on the presentation but if i've run over just give me a nudge um i've got this giant um the vision was what is it like to walk when you scale up a human to the size of a forest and uh, look at the airflow into the lungs, you know, the splits, the lungs are like huge trees laid on their side, the heart, you know, the oxygen diffuses into the blood flows around into the, um, into the heart, which is kind of like a bait ball. It's like the center. And from that center, it's feeding every single like trillions and trillions of cells um, with oxygen and nutrients. And so really you're, you're much more like a flowing event and our skin kind of creates this uh, feeling of being much more static than we really are. Um, oh, this is an extra train. Let me just try again. Oh, that's a shame. Um, I might be able to open it and find her afterwards, but... Um, so from that vision, so we, we developed this vision with Eric and then, um, and then we've been going through the process of trying to find scientific partners and um, to make the work real. So this is a data set from the Fraunhofer Institute that are looking inside the human body and it's blood flow through the heart. And so this is one of the big inspirations actually. And so taking this, I mean, I suppose the first thing is that we're, we're all conscious of our heartbeat, but whoever thought of this beautiful kind of knot that's at the center of us pumping away um it's just a, a beautiful thing to see and um so we start doing look development of that taking it into houdini um, um thinking about uh, blood flow and fluid dynamics um we went to the fraunhofer institute and did a whole load of fmri um, scans this is my body here it's my heart um, you can see in the brain there, like check out the, the there's a symmetry in the left and right. Um, you've got the, uh, it's kind of like these meandering corkscrewing rivers. Um, and um, actually like when that main artery runs up through your neck, it's about the width of the top of a bottle of wine and it's pumping at three feet a second. So it's incredible pressure. Um, some of the data we got, um, you know, we started to process it. You can see this is some of the fMRI data of the, the key organs. I'm going to whiz through because I know I'm going to be short of time. The, um, it's just a Cinema 4D render, but 
as we were processing the data, we just started to explore different um, different ways of treating it, thinking about um, you know, how this is going to form an environment. Um, and then I've just got a few, I thought you guys might be interested in a bit of the background. So um, we take the source um, volume data, basically the fMRI data. Um, we're bringing that into Houdini and we can filter out, um, basically the data is a kind of, uh, it creates a black and white image of the density. So you can filter it out to, to pull out um, the different airways and capillaries. So this is one of the airways of the lungs. Um, then on the left here, you can see sort of there's a point at which the data runs out and then we, um, we looked at branching algorithms to add more detail and same in the brain on the right there. This is actually inside the brain. So by filtering different sections, you can get a sense for the different geometries running through the, the brain, um, which is fascinating and, and beautiful. And this is the projects in development at the moment. So this is the best image I've got for you. It's our giant human, everything's in real time. And these big um, kind of monoliths are about six foot tall. They're TV screens that are using head tracking. So it's not virtual reality, actually. Um, the exhibition's going to be these, these screens that act like windows into the body. Um, so I just wanted to end on a, a, a quote, that, another quote, <laughs> a quote that really tickles tickles me. I mean, I'm a big fan of Terence McKenna, but nature is not our enemy to be raped, conquered. Nature is ourselves to be cherished and explored. And these are some of the reference images that um, I've been collecting um, that sort of fed into the, the, the idea behind this project. Cool. Thank you. So I'll just hit stop sharing. Thank you very much, Barney. My goodness, I mean, that looks incredibly beautiful. That Eric's visions and your vision of what this project's going to be, it looks absolutely stunning. Um, and the, those last pictures that you showed there, uh, where you sort of you seem to be drawing an analogy between what's happening inside the human body and then things like river deltas and, and the roots of plants, et cetera. Um, yeah. Are you going to try and make those connections apparent when this exhibition actually opens? Yeah, I think that's the intention. Um, I mean, it's a fine line because, um, I mean, just just sort of really clearly there's, um, you know, we grow out of this, to sort of quote Alan Watts, we grow out of a planet like an apple grows out of an apple tree. It's like there's, you give a rock enough time in the right conditions and, you know, life sprouts and there's patterns that, um, that flow through all of life and we share them with the plants and, you know, th these branching algorithms are kind of, kind of there in everything. And, um, and so, yeah, there's definitely a sensitivity and what we're finding is that the medical data just, it does it all basically just um it's more about trying to push the boundaries of of getting the best data we can possibly get our hands on um often you get like the main arteries but you don't get the capillaries but then there's um papers out there that talk about the algorithms because doctors are trying to um understand the ge geometry to do better surgery so at the forefront of medical imaging there you know, they're, they're creating algorithms that predict where things will be um, based on the structures of capillaries and, and stuff. So uh, we're able to tap into all of that um, re research and you just, just end up with incredibly complicated, beautiful, um, meandering, branching lungs and organs. And uh, so we're, it's going to be a long project for us. This is the, the first... I can't see any of these projects ever ending in a way because it's an, an exploration that's constantly updated by the technology that's able to image these things. And I, I think that um, with that comes, you know, different, a different lens and a, a new sense of wonder. So it's kind of an evolving idea that we can just keep coming back to. Um, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat um, and, then, and then we'll 
if you're part of the lab and you're here in the webinar, we'll ask you to present them. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, then we'll draw them in and I'll, I'll put them for you. Um, so we've got some questions coming in, but um, uh, I just wanted to ask you one more question about, about this and your previous projects, about working with scientists. Um, so can you tell me a bit about how you work with scientists? Have you always worked with them in all of the projects that you've mentioned? apart from those commercial ones at the beginning. Um, and then, and how, do you, how deeply do you work with them? Do you just approach people for research or do you actually involve them in brainstorming as well? Um, yeah, it's kind of, I think everyone that works on our projects is involved in the brainstorming. Uh, it's quite open um, and um, you know, ideas or turning points can come from, from anybody who's involved in the process. But like, the idea of working with scientists is often, um, better than the reality because they're really busy doing the thing that they're famous for like they've got their research papers or they want to publish stuff and so often um often they're very busy but I, what we've found with this project um it's been the best collaboration so far because the Fraunhofer Institute have got a um it's called Mavis Lab at Fraunhofer and um they've basically got an arts program where they subsidize their um, R&D department to work with artists and collaborate on projects. So they had like an internal budget that they could assign to a team that meant that we could um, keep, keep going back to them and asking them to change things or focus um, more attention on different organs. And so that's been amazing. And they've had lots of time. We went out there and used their fMRI scanner and did a workshop with them and um, yeah so that that's worked really well and also the project um like these things so we're, we're doing commercial projects to subsidize our artworks and um and so you can start a conversation with the scientists before you've even got budget to make the project so we were talking to them um about their data sets to see if we could do some experiments and then um and then they offered up this collaboration where they would support the initial research before the project was commissioned. So it was actually through reaching out to them that the project got started, which then lead, leads to a commissioner. Um, so it's going to be part of um, York Mediale and, uh, and Coventry. I should know the name of the Coventry Festival. I, I believe it's like the city of culture, um, but it's, it's coming around next year. And so that will be... Uh, they're the two key commissioners that have allowed us to, to make the work. Great. Um, we've got a question from um, Dane Christensen. Would you like to join us, Dane? You can turn the camera on. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you for your presentation. Highly, extremely inspiring. Um, you mentioned briefly your the business model, and I'd be curious if you could expand more about uh, either the business model of the projects and or of Marshmallow Laser Feast. Yeah, so the, we're definitely not businessmen. We're like, we're sort of, the, I, I think like one, one way of looking at it is um, the projects that are going to pay the bills aren't necessarily um, they're not representative of, of our artistic aspirations. So um, a lot of us started off in working in animation and, and then um, looking to people like the Arts Council, the British Council to fund our art projects in between freelancing. And so that kind of set around this idea that you, you do commercial work to save a bit of money and then you do an underfunded art project where you use some of the money you've saved to, to create um, your artwork. And, the, the great thing about that is it creates a feedback loop because who's going to support you to make artwork unless you do it's like you you have to pay for it basically um and then hopefully if it all works out you'll get to a point where other people want to pay for it but to create that opportunity you have to invest your time and money yourself but but then but what is that because whatever you end up doing, you're, you're molding yourself through the process. So um, if, you, if you decide, ah, oh, I'm not gonna do the artwork, I'm just gonna do the commercial stuff, it, it's gonna have an impact on who you are. And like, if you're a salesman and you're doing that every day, it's, it changes who you are. And so I think really for us, the artistic practice is, 
um, you know, it's like doing meditation every day. It's uh, it, you question everything and you explore and you research and you collaborate. And so I think everyone in the company has had an experience of that in the past and they've come, come into the, this sort of collective um, understanding that art projects are about something other than the money. And um, so that's, and then, and then we're always sort of getting into trouble because we spend too much money on the art stuff and, we, and then we're like, oh man, um, we're in real trouble. And then, then we're like focus and we do commercials and it, it, it always bounces out. And we've got Nell, um, who's Robin's um, wife. Robin's one of our creative partners along with Urson and Urson. Um, but Nell is basically has the unenviable job of reining it all in. And over the years, she's got really good at um, applying for funding. So we, we, we have more success on, um, on getting funding for our projects like research grants and things. And um, I just think over time, we're now at a point where we're probably doing like uh, maybe one third commercial and the rest of it is working on the artwork. So um, we're very fortunate in that respect. Uh, you say that you're, you're interested in touring We Live in an Ocean of Air. Mm. Um, so how would you put that kind of a tour together and what, and what would you do, you, do you go to different art gallery spaces and do you go into it saying, we'll do a split on, on the takings or do you expect to get an upfront fee from them? And sort of, what, are there any models for these or do, do you have to work each one out individually? Yeah, so I'm probably not the best one. I can speak about it from what I know, but my, Mike, um, we didn't know what we were doing initially. And with the Saatchi Gallery opportunity, that they just tried, um, they tried Tree Hugger and then they had a, an opening in their gallery space and they understood that in order to charge for tickets, because they were trying to shift to a model where they could um, generate revenue, it's hard to charge for paintings and photography when that's been free or, or when generally it's free but when it's got tech innovation involved it's easy to charge so um they they saw us as an opportunity for them to do that for the first time and um but then we went into it as well just kind of blind but because we're doing lots of installations and stuff that engages the public i guess we had we had the right team in order to pull it all together and um, working with people from theatre background and set designers. And so it all kind of came together, but was really, we really scrutinised it uh, based on how many people can you get through um, an hour? And, um, you know, are you going to generate enough revenue for it to be self-sustaining? And I think it's easy to get carried away and create something that has like large sets. Initially, we were thinking, oh, we want these big structures because... Uh, the tactile sense is so important in virtual reality, but, but the reality of that is then you've got like big shipping containers. And so when you've got to do a tour, you, you, you we've done it in the past where we can't show work because shipping costs are too high. Um, it's also the carbon footprint of these things. So it was done in a way that was as lightweight as possible. It's like a black box focused on um, backpack PCs and, um, and we were using a Vive tracking system and stuff. So um, so basically, all in all, I think there is a hunger for immersive experiences and, um, and you know, that's always been the way, if you think of um, like any science museums or natural history museums, they're looking for ways to engage their audience and tell those stories. And so there's that side. And then I think the art world as well is looking for different business models. So there's opportunities in both camps. Um, and we don't come from the art world. I think the, the reason that we're sort of sitting in between the two is that art for us is when we do exactly what we want to do. No one's, it's not commissioned. Nobody's telling us what we should be doing. And so that's, that's how we see it as being artwork. But the artwork is, is really um, just the output of collaborations of lots of people on, on ideas of sort of dissolving the boundary between us and and nature and so it's, it's sort of it's yeah i guess it, to, there's something about it when when you're serving an idea it's got nothing to do with you it's not like you can sit there and go oh 
going to dream up this thing I want to do. It's more like it's, it's answering the brief itself. It's something that's telling you what to do constantly. And so in that sense, we're kind of at the service of um, exploring nature, you know, working with scientists and it, it, it always answers itself. And there's always a beauty or, or a story there that often science is excluding because they're interested in the empirical. Um, but there's always a beauty there that's kind of put to one side that we can pick up and then, and that, that's really how it tends to work. So Barna has got a question that kind of follows on a little bit from, from that. So can you join us, Barna? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I, um, I, I, as I understood, um, one of your main goals is to change our uh, relationship in nature. And I, I really appreciate that. And, and I find it very important. And um, you especially mentioned an example uh, with the eyes of the animal where when people took off their headsets and like experiencing it there uh, in the forest, they, you, you observed that they looked differently at their environment. And what always comes up for us who are working on um, you know, a project that has kind of a similar goal is, how do you make that change uh, of you know relationship or change of behavior a lasting one? Mm -hmm. And I and I'm sure you you know you thought about this a lot. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think it's um, it's trick. It's definitely a tricky one because like right now, what are we doing? It's like twenty pounds a ticket to do a, an installation at the Saatchi Gallery. <laughs> That's like, that's not, that hardly fits that idea of creating any kind of change. But I think if you look, you know, look, look 10 years back and think about mobile phones and, you know, where's this immersive tech going to be in 10 years time? I'm, I'm sure that there's, um, you know, whether it's contact lenses or whatever format it's taking, I think the, the, there's no doubt that the power of taking you out of your skin and allowing you to well just you know what we've been talking about there's there's a real power in that and that powers uh, the technology is going to get cheaper you'll be able to reach larger audiences we sort of talk about it like sneaking magic mushrooms into the school omelet that you could have you know already you can go out with your quest and run around a football field so you know you can imagine turning you know football fields and school gymnasiums into immensely intricate sort of simulations of ecosystems that allow you to explore all manner of different sensory perspectives and somehow that collage whether you're experiencing photosynthesis or or, or, or following the journey of water or, or different organism pollinating a flower there's so many sort of microcosms and fascinating symbiosis going on that we we can imagine it's a little bit like Attenborough's just nailed the film. He spent his whole life nailing film and there's it's always innovation in terms of camera work with the stuff he does. And so I think we're sort of thinking of a similar, you know, narrative in that we want to be nailing immersive experiences of these things. And so it, it might not be now that, that we're, uh, we're learning our craft and it's the beginning of that journey. So now might not be the time that we're going to have any kind of impact, but um you know five ten years time you can guarantee that this this technology if if we haven't just like imploded um that, that we might be able to reach huge audiences with experiences that um that are sort of scientifically grounded and really do have a, a lasting impact i mean the same could be said for you know attenborough's shows that you know i don't know whether you could ever quantify how many hearts is He's sort of turned on towards you know stop eating fish or become a vegetarian but um i'm sure that he's had some kind of impact and um yeah but i, I guess intention's key right you've got to give it a try and um and just sort of surrender to that pathway and hopefully and we're not trying to say that we're we're like walking the walk or talking the talk, we're still doing commercials like selling cars and, and you know, we, we, need to, we need to bring money in in order to do this. And it's, it's like not 100% clear, but the, the pathway um, is sort of presenting itself and we're, we're sort of do, doing what we can. Um, yeah. 
But Jamie Pereira is a former lab participant and he's been watching on Facebook. Um, he's a musician and a composer who is uh, a kind of expert in data sonification. So taking data points and turning that into music. And yeah. His question is, um, what's your criteria for how accurately you represent the data in, in the most recent project versus the beautiful expression of that data? Hmm. I'd say there's definitely a point in which the data stops and um, it's disappointingly, um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we were thinking basically when you're looking at um, other animals, like not humans, then they, they don't really have a problem with like doing crazy amounts of detail and like killing the subject and um, or, or using like a, a scanning technique that would, would give you cancer. You know, there's, so you, you can get images of, fly brains that are incredibly detailed but when it comes to the um human brain there's not there are some pretty detailed um the fiber tracts and stuff that are in the, the human brain are pretty well mapped but there's still a lot of detail that's not there so what we do is work with the the scientists to try and um basically create a representation of what we know and then when we get into that area of what we don't know i think Partly it depends on, um, on budget and how engaged the scientists are. But what we've always found is that the more, the more it's based on um, the reality, there's this beauty that comes through that you can't invent. So for example, if you were to say, let's animate blood flow through a heart, there's no way we would have done it in a way that looked as beautiful and intricate as that, um, you know, the thing that I presented earlier, the, the blood flow through a human heart. And so. I think that's the golden rule is you push it as far as you can. And then in terms of the poetry, just trying to have that as informed by science as, as possible. Um, and then I guess the final part is that there is, there is a point at which, um, yeah, you're, you're saying, okay, so what, you know, what color palette are you going to use for the blood? And um, for example, a lot of this project is about motion. So we're tying velocity to color palettes so that it picks out the fluid dynamics and the motion within the simulation, which is something that doesn't happen in reality, but it has the effect of um, enhancing um, the movement of particles as it moves through the system. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a balance and the scientists are always happy to um, sort of um, present the work with us and we're quite open about where that boundary lies um, and yeah. Yeah, it's kind of the way it flows. We've got two more questions. Can we just try and squeeze them in? Um, first of all, from Sebastian. Would you like to join us, Seba? Hey, guys. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering about your, your relationship with uh, the software and hardware developers in your creative process. Uh, now these days is changing all the time and more and more gadgets and tools and haptic tools have been developed. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. So we, it's a job to stay on top of it. And, but normally when a new project starts, we'll just with the internal resources, we'll, We'll just reach out to everybody we know and do a blast on um, different haptics or different sensors and, and so there's normally like an r d phase where we just reach out because nearly everything that you learn on your older projects six months later things have changed um so for example the breath sensor that we used for ocean of air is like this little uh, thermometer that senses the temperature change when you're breathing on it and that created a really nice curve. Um, it was a it was it was a perfect perfect bit of tech, but I understand that they're building that into different headsets now. So there's a constant wrestling in terms of the hardware, and it definitely helps to sort of stay in touch with um, Vive and these people and try and kind of um, you know just get the new headsets when they come out. Um, so that's that's one element to it. And then on the software side, we've we're always working with um, a pretty diverse range of freelancers. And um, although we've got a pretty solid core team, I think it's, it's nearly always true to say that the, um, 
the, the the hands that are doing the the coding so for example in ocean of air um we work with natan sinigaglia who's a v4 um expert and he spent ages trying to get this fluid real-time fluid working and um and so like so much time and money and energy went into that but then that became the backbone of the whole piece and so it's about like spending time to you know, you know you've got a creative vision but then um you have to talk to lots of people to try and build the right team to to really um see it come to life so i guess the to to sum that thing up i'm like a pdf machine i'm just making these presentations I've got a vision I've got a vision of what i want to do and then and then you've got to find someone to buy it and then you've got to hook the team that you want to work on it and, and often there's a core bunch in MLF and then lots of other people around that, that are involved and and it's there's there's no preciousness either like the boat you set out to build always gets changed like the blueprints get changed and um, yeah and it's long-term relationships we work with people for years um, even though they're freelancers it's um, that's the way it tends to go Last questions from Rose and you join us Rose Hello, hello, hey, can you hear? Yep. Good. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're running a project. Uh, there's four of us on the call. Uh, that's called Sonic Ceremonials, which is kind of centered around a ceremony uh, about microbes within your body. Oh, nice. And so that your kind of fMRI scanning of the body kind of really, really inspired us because you actually like you're actually getting data uh from a real body and obviously we haven't got enough time for this for the next time but we're wondering about experience that you have about if you kind of have experience about monitoring or gathering data or observing the kind of more unseen aspects like um microbes for one because they're very invisible unlike sort of blood vessels and vascular structures and stuff and sort of all like pheromones and stuff and how you kind of you know, would you have your experience of like trying to get, I guess, like scientifically or, you know, or empirically analyze any of those aspects yep. to end up with a kind of more poetic example at the end? I guess that's the kind of crux. Yeah. So like, um, we'd, we're super fascinated by bacteria, but we haven't, um, and sort of the body is this big ecosystem, but our, our approach would be um, just doing a load of Google binging and it's obviously it's pretty easy to find um, papers these days and scientists are, are normally uh, pretty interested um, whether they've got much time is another thing but they're genuinely interested in having a conversation where their published paper um, is going to be brought to life through an animation or an artwork because that's often um, uh, get some more exposure and and that's something that's valuable to them so i'd say that the starting point should be loads of r d find out who's at the forefront of um you know ted talks is uh you know they are, they are what they are but they're, they're a brilliant way of sort of seeing who's leading in different fields and you can get some names and and what universities are they at and then so i'm just like sending people messages um either like on instagram or vimeo or or just directly to their emails that you can get off the university websites. And I just kind of say, oh, you know, keep it short because they're always busy and just, I'll put maybe some images in there and say we're doing this project and we'd love just to have a conversation with you. And so I'm doing that all the time. And um, it's got better the, the longer we've been doing stuff, people respond better because you can put nicer pictures in the email <laughs> or something like that. But like without that, I, you know, I, I wouldn't know where to start because I'm not a scientist. And I think um, if you don't ground it in science, it, it, it probably won't have the um, impacts it could have uh, without that partner. Thanks a lot. Um, before you go, uh, Dane just wanted to know why are you called Marshmallow Laser Feast? Where did that come oh, It's a shame Robin's not here. We were, we were two separate companies um found and flatty and we had uh we'd done this playstation projection mapping thing together and and part of our whole thing because we were like oh yeah we should uh we should leave let, let's leave our companies and start this new thing and because someone was doing an interview we we're like oh we need to come up with a name and we've been practicing just being 
spontaneous. Um, and so Robin was just like, marshmallow laser feast, and just spat it out. We were on a train actually. We, we said, oh, let's, let's come up with a name before we get off the train. So he, he said, that was the first thing he said. And then we tried a few more things and we got off the train. And then that, that was it, marshmallow laser feast. Just like a bolt of lightning. It kind of fits. I mean, I, yeah, we all felt a bit uncomfortable, but we also, you know, when you analyze it, you can, Virgin has a certain meaning and then Branson turns it into a transportation company. I think you can kind of repurpose any word and brand it as you like. So uh, that's what we went with. <laughs> Although people always get it wrong, Marshmallow Laser Factory. <laughs> that was a, let's get that one. <laughs> Well, thank you very, very much. It's been really fascinating and entertaining. Um, uh, so thanks a lot to thank you, Barney, and to, to the CPH Docs team and yeah, to thanks. the participants as well. Great. All right. Bye for now. Okay. Thanks then. Cheers.